Hello and welcome to Conscious TV. I'm Renate McNay and my guest today is Cynthia Borjo. Hello, Cynthia. I'm Hello, so happy Hello, Renata. Good you to see here. you. Uh, Cynthia, and I have to read it because it's too long to memorize, is a modern day mystic, Episcopal priest, writer, and international, internationally known retreat leader. Cynthia divides her time between solitude at her seaside hermitage in Maine and traveling globally to teach and spread the recovery of the Christian contemplative and wisdom path. That sounds lovely to have a seaside hermitage. <laughs> oh, it is. You should try it, though, in December. <laughs> well, I, in December you the are The sea is an angry mistress. Yes, yes. I would love to have one in the mountains. Yeah. The hermitage. Yeah. I'm more a mountain goat than a sea person. <laughs> Why doesn't that surprise me? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I show you some of Cynthia's books. So the Centering Prayer, and there is a follow-up up coming in the pipeline. Uh, it's called The Heart of Centering Prayer, Non-Dual Christianity in Theory and Practice. And this book is coming out in December. December 2016. Wonderful. We are looking forward to that. Uh, a book on Mary Magdalena. And of course, a book on Jesus, Wisdom Jesus. And uh, Love is Stronger Than Death. This is a very beautiful book, my most favorite book. I read it already twice. And um, The Wisdom Way of Knowing and mystical hope. You're very, are you writing all this book, books in your hermitage? Ah, uh, yes, actually. <laughs> yes. <laughs> actually, I think they all got written there. Yeah. Okay, Cynthia, I'd like to start with the question, um, how did your Christian life begin? How, what happened that you have chosen the Christian path? Well, in a way, it was what the, the Buddhists would call a choiceless choice, mm -hmm. that uh, when I found myself growing up as a, as a child in the 1950s in, uh, in the area around Philadelphia in the United States, uh, Christianity was all there was. I mean, our biggest choice was, were you a Catholic or a Methodist? Uh, and uh, what really began my journey was that my, my parents sent me to a Quaker school that that was easy to do back in, in, in the Philadelphia area because it's sort of one of the natural uh, homes of Quakers. So we had this wonderful little school, about 60 children between the ages of 5 and 12. And as part of the Quaker heritage, uh, we would all go in once a week for a silent meeting for worship. Beautiful. So we would troop into this uh, beautiful old 18th century meeting house with great clear lights pouring in from upper windows. And the, the whole program in, Chris, in, in Quakerism is to sit and gather your heart in silence until the spirit might move you to speak. What does, uh, what does that mean, gather your, your heart, heart in silence? Well, it, mean, it means to begin with, shut up. Right. So instead of going into a place where you start like you do in a church with people proclaiming words at you or singing songs, or you come in and you sit in silence in, yeah. what, in yeah. what looks like and really is meditation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the only real difference between a Quaker meeting for worship and silent meditation is that if the Spirit moves you after a time in Quaker meeting, you get up and speak the message that's been given in your heart. All oh, right. And then it goes yeah. back into silence, and then somebody else might stand and speak, moved by that message, but not debating, just so it kind of builds a teaching, which is, it's almost downloaded from the cosmos yeah. and created by the listening hearts in the room. Yeah. So in that kind of environment, I first touched in a very simple and direct way what you might call the mystical field of love that surrounds us and binds our hearts together uh, and is the real presence of, of, uh, of God. But you were only six years old. I was only six years old. And how, how, did you, how did you figure out what it was? Well, you just know it in the heart. You know it. I yeah. mean, 
with all theories of reincarnation aside from the moment, yeah. there is an ancient knowingness in the child. Mm -hmm. There's a knowingness that, that seeks for familiarity. Mm -hmm. And the things in the world that are true, that are powerful, that are, that are unobstructed, uh, unveiled, yeah. ring so clear in the heart of a child. So I was going off to Sunday school too at the Christian Scientists, which was my parents' denomination, mm -hmm. and I didn't feel that clarity. I felt noise and words and theories and manipulation, and there was just this deep, deep, profound yesness and connection that I knew in the meeting. So that plus the natural world around me was the start. Yeah. And, uh, then in the course of time I began to become interested in, uh, in music, mm -hmm. you know, and, and again music, choral music spoke to me deeply. Mm -hmm. And it was through that that the, the path of Christianity that I'd formerly only known as doctrine and dogma shoved down my throat began to come alive in that same way it had as a child, as, uh, as the experience of love and beauty offered to the infinite. Mm. So I always had those, uh, those kinds of streaks already in my, in my belt. And, and I would say that the reason that I, I, I manifested on the Christian path, if you want to call it that, was a, a couple of reasons. First of all, because I really had no choice. Yeah. Back in that time, back in the 50s in Philadelphia, uh, there weren't at the point Buddhists and Sufis and Hindus running around where you could find them and, mm -hmm. and consider, you know, the, 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 the only question was what kind of a Christian were you going to be, not, mm -hmm. not were you going to get out of the, the religion altogether. Uh, and the second was because of a, a real kind of profound, uh, you might call it a conversion experience that happened to me when I was 20. Yes. That really yes. kind of changed everything. Yes. So that was when you first time got the communion. Yes. I, yeah. uh, I received communion by accident, yeah. the Holy Communion, you know, the, the most sacred ritual of Christianity when you come up and receive the bread and the wine that mm -hmm. has been offered and received as the living body of Jesus. Yeah. Normally a very, very protected thing. You study and you work for a long time before you're initiated. Well, I got initiated very, very quickly by total accident. Mm -hmm. uh, in Christian science, uh, communion did happen once a month, but it happened in the church, and uh, we were only in Sunday school, so we didn't know about it. And, mm -hmm. and Quakers don't do that sort of thing mm -hmm. because they, they believe that every moment ought to be a full communion with Christ. So yeah. if that's happening, who needs bread and wine? Yeah. So I, I wasn't presented with this. And when I was 20, I went with my college roommate uh, to what I thought was a, a concert. <laughs> the, <laughs> the boy choir from, from St. Paul's Cathedral in London was doing a concert on Sunday morning at St. Paul's Anglican Church in London, Ontario. So all I saw in the newspaper was that they were doing the William Byrd uh, Mass in Four Voices, one of my favorite sort of beautiful Renaissance singing pieces. I said, let's go. Mm -hmm. So I dragged my college roommate with me and off we went and I was so enraptured with the music that I didn't even notice that there were long kind of talk breaks between the various movements. Well, come to find out it was just music offered as part of the sermon or the service. Mm -hmm. And the next thing you know, a very stern looking usher is standing in front of our row of pews and motioning us forward. So I said, oh, oh, I'm in a communion line. <laughs> help, help. <laughs> you know, my mother who was Christian science and uh, had a profound <laughs> loathing and fear of Catholic tradition had warned me about terrible things that, that happen when this happens yeah. to you. <laughs> But, but at that moment, my, my, my fear of the usher was greater than my fear of eternal damnation. <laughs> so up I went. And my, my roommate, who had fortunately been raised Catholic, said, just follow me and do what I do. Mm -hmm. So she put out her hands, and I put up my hands, and into my hands was placed this wafer. And she looked over at me and said, don't chew it. <laughs> so hard. 
And then comes along this, this beautiful silver, silver chalice of wine, and she hisses over at me, don't touch it. And I was about to say, well, how can you drink it without touching it when it's put to my lips? And I, yeah. so it happens. Mm -hmm. And I'm walking back to my pew thinking, well, that's that. Yeah. And all of a sudden, I'm about two thirds of the way back to the pew, and all of a sudden I realize, that's that. And it wasn't like I'd met my risen Lord, there wasn't a big Jesus image in front of me, but there was just that ancient sense of familiarity once again, mm -hmm. that this dimension that had been missing all my life that I hadn't found in my 1950s childhood in Philadelphia was there. This, this other intensity, as the poet T.S. Eliot calls it. And how, how, how did you feel it? Where did you feel it? It was right in the heart. Yes. It was right uh, very profoundly uh, a sense that I'd met my path yeah. and I'd met my master and that it was, and that this master was a someone not a theory to be mastered, not a, not a set of creeds to be recited. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was a deep sense of invitation to a path. It was really an initiation. And I think that over and over again has been the reason that I've, I've stuck with Christianity through thick and thin, with my eyes open. Mm -hmm. I've said many, many times that, you know, if I, if I could have been a Sufi, I would have done it in a heartbeat. Mm. But uh, when you receive what really your own heart of heart receives as an invitation from a living master to come this way, mm. you don't say, sorry Jesus, I'd rather be a Sufi. Yes. And, and my sense, I've, I've worked closely with the religious, many of the religious traditions, and I, I have a great belief that, that like colors of the rainbow, they all belong together, and it requires every one of them to show the full spectrum mm. of divine love. Mm. But the path that I've been plunked down on and called to manifest in and serve in is this particular ray of the rainbow. Yes. So what, the, what does serving, manifesting and serving mean for you? Well, it really means uh, a couple of things. One of, the, one of the dimensions is to try wherever you are to be conscious mm -hmm. and to be grateful mm -hmm. and to be alert yeah. and to see what needs to be done in the moment and to do it in such a way that you're moving in a direction of, of, of greater compassion, greater love and greater understanding in the planet. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I would say that's the simplest version yeah. Uh, I, I don't like to sort of obscure it with devotion talk and God talk, and I don't have any sort of uh, a special notion of my importance or of being in some sort of consecrated path. That, that's mm -hmm. sort of too inflated terminology. Mm -hmm. I mean, every human being is consecrated just by the fact of being born. And we have, we have our life to live, and we either live it awake and consciously or we snooze through it. Yeah. And if we live it awake and consciously, we touch other human beings who are trying that same way and we begin to touch a container and a shape of awakeness uh, that's different mm. from anything else on the planet. Mm. So that's where I, that's where I work and, and while I hold down the corner in Christianity, it really is a universal work each of the tradi traditions participate in it mm. in their own way. Mm. Uh, to reveal, I think, the, what, what divine love looks like in, in created form. So tell us about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I would say that, that one of the things that we tend to forget in the planet because so many, 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 many thousands of years we've, we've spent thinking that, that there's something wrong with being here, mm. that it's illusion, it's maya, it's sin, it's coarse, it's 
contaminated. Right. It's still in some teachings. Yeah, it's yeah. it's it's still in most of the teachings. Yes. I yes. mean that you just go from one teaching to another, but they yes. all start with the fact that the there's something not trustworthy about the human condition, yeah. not good about it, and that spiritual uh, spiritual transformation means getting out of it, leaving the whole thing behind like a dead booster yeah. rocket, yeah. and boosting off into some spiritual world. But I think what we forget, and what's, what's actually there in the heart of Christianity, although Christianity has forgotten it as well as all the others, is this affirmation that God so loved the world, that there's something very, very precious here. Mm. In this dimension, in this form with purple sofas and glasses of water and bodies uh, mm -hmm. and embodiment and love and rejection and trial and death and suffering, something in the mix of that that brings forth a manifestation of love mm -hmm. that's so precious that it can be uttered in no other way. Yeah. And we're, we're here for a little while, as the poet Blake said, to learn to bear the beams of love and to manifest them forth as what the heart of God looks like. Mm -hmm. But this is quite a journey. It is. To come to this point where you are free to love. Yeah. And so my question is, um, how does Christianity address our deep wounds and, and delusions? Yeah. How, yeah. How does, well, I think all the traditions uh, address them or don't address them mm -hmm. on two levels. Uh, the, one level uh, the one level that's there from the beginning is in the great language and offering and energy of the, the whole world of sacraments and devotions. That, that as things get offered up, like in Christianity, the, the Eucharist, the Holy Communion, uh, as the image gets, gets lifted up, as ghoulish as it may seem at first, of the suffering Christ on the cross, there's actually a wisdom being conveyed there that, that does give comfort and healing. Problem is we don't mostly get that because something else has to kick in before any of this becomes really operative in our brains and our hearts. And that's the, that's the path that, that begins to get open up when we start to do conscious inner work. So how did that start with you, Cynthia? How did you get it? How did it start with me? Well, of course, I had my first wonderful run at mystical rapture. You know, I had the Eucharist. I'd had this experience I told you of. Yeah. I had the beauty of singing. Mm. Uh, it catapulted me into, uh, into wanting to be a priest yeah. and feeling that what I wanted to do was to serve up this communion and, uh, uh, you know, all the usual mystery and drama. And uh, so I did, I was ordained uh, in the Episcopal Church in 1979, uh, was the, the Episcopalians were among the first of the main line, the greater family of, of, of churches, Christian churches in that great, greater Catholic tradition to ordain women. Mm -hmm. And I was among the first that was ordained in that tradition. Mm -hmm. So here I am, a priest in my bright, shiny black, black suit and white clericals. And, and then I began to notice, to my horror, that no matter how much I preached the scripture at people, no matter how much you offered up the Eucharist, people remained people. Gossipy, nasty, confrontational, divisive, uh, always tending to splinter into small groups and to act out of their mm -hmm. hidden agendas. And I, I realized, dear God, there's nothing we've got here that's actually getting people to change. Yeah. So I went searching myself. And it was about that time uh, that what fell into my lap, as things always fall into your lap when you say you're searching, mm -hmm. was a copy of a bu book called In Search of the M Miraculous, written by P.D. Ospinsky in the 1940s, yeah. which was the, his record of the teachings of the spiritual teacher G.I. Gurdjieff, yeah. uh, who was an underground spiritual teacher of the 20th century and was the first to bring to the West a practice 
which nowadays we'd call mindfulness. Yeah. They didn't have that language yet, and, mm -hmm. and the Gurdjieff work was a, was a very, very, uh, I would say, uh, cumbersome early run-up on mindfulness training. But it did open the question of how do you wake up? Yeah. How do you pay attention? Do you even know that you're spending your life snoozing through on autopilot? Something pushes your button and you're off and running in that direction. Yeah. And someone thing pulls your chain and you're running in this direction. Yeah. And yet you say you're alive. So the Gurdjieff work, I, I entered and was a serious student of it for 10 years, uh, which really laid down in me the basis for understanding our own responsibility in waking up and making actual, confronting that, that vast maze of automatic program behaviors that, uh, that, that keep us chained at a level that's lower than real human freedom. So I worked in that for a long time. I still work in it. I have the deepest, most deep respect for this, this body of knowledge. Mm. Uh, but it led me, and then by the time I was really getting serious in that work, uh, in Christianity there were beginning to de be developed these wonderful paths of meditation which hadn't been a part of normal Christian kind of religious upbringing till that point. Uh, so from my teacher Thomas Keating, a great Trappist monk, I learned a very simple form of sitting meditation called centering prayer. Mm. And the combination of centering prayer, uh, bringing all the effects that have now been documented that meditation does for the brain and for the heart, when you begin met to meditate seriously, plus this wonderful grab bag of teachings from the Gurdjieff work on conscious awakening. So did you do the movements? I did the movements, yeah. yes. How was that? Oh, chilling, you know. The movements are, are I would say, the great sacred liturgy of the Gurdjieff work. The, the, for, the Gurdjieff work wouldn't consider it that way, but in these, in these very, very simple uh, dances, you can call them, although they're not that, they're more sacred gestures that you learn to take in beautiful sort of sequences and pay attention in the middle of them. Uh, some of them very complicated, some of them heartbreakingly simple, and to music that is beautifully written in, to go yeah. right into the, the chakras that need to be adjusted. Yeah. And off it goes. It, it leaves you writhing on the floor with just the, the, the wonder and the terror and the beauty of this whole, uh, this whole journey and form. Yeah, you said, you said um, that they are like rabbit holes. Yeah. Yeah, and sometimes you were lying on the floor and you get crying and you get sucked down into and of course they, they pick you right up because those kinds of displays of being slain in the spirit are not on. <laughs> uh, so you learn to contain your ecstasy and you learn to contain your anguish and move on and take the next position. But meanwhile something is being touched at a level that's so profound that again you can only get a felt sense that life hangs together by some deeper coherence and compassion. And, and I think our theologies and our doctrines and our dogmas and our principles try and take that and put it in mental form, but the mental form never touches that sense that something holds together. And, yes. and I felt that in the movement so profoundly. And you cannot name it. What, what well, you can name it, but you name it in code phrases that can, yes, you, yes. you feel the, the suffering of God, you feel your, your wish to, to relieve the sorrow of his endlessness, as Gurdjieff called it. Yeah. You say the words, Lord, have mercy, yeah. and you realize that they're not about somebody getting down and begging for pity behind, before a great God who's a judge, but, but a deep sense of, of, of remorse and seeing at the vastness of the whole thing and the terror yeah. of the whole thing. Yeah, it is a terror. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. But not the kind of terror that they put in the tabloids of uh, three more people dead in the street, but, <laughs> no. but the kind of terror of that, that something so immense, mm -hmm. that something so beautiful, mm -hmm. that something so sacred yes. and veiled in the heart of God and how, could come out. And, and how beauty and suffering belongs to They each belong there, the two, yeah. two inevitable sides of the same coin yeah. of the intimacy of God. Yes. So, so you see this and you feel this as you dig the capaciousness of your soul, the, the capacity to hold this, this wine uh, of yearning and suffering and beauty without being destroyed by it. Yeah. So you must have a, quite a, an open heart to be able to... Oh, on my better days. <laughs> <laughs> to hold, to be able to hold the suffering and the pain and and the sorrow which is really running through yeah, the, yeah, yeah. through through the earth. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah, or like like Thich Nhat Hanh says, uh, listen to the earth cry. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And these are all kinds of things that are absolutely real, but they make no sense on the level of the mind alone. Yeah. No. Oh, what about the earth crying? The earth's not crying. The earth is rocks. They're not sentient. Mm. It's when you, it's when you come down into the full embodied being, that you begin to hear and you begin to see, yeah. and respond to these threads of coherence, yeah. rather than having to project them out. You know, there's a huge, huge difference between explanation and meaning. Yes. Yeah. And, and mostly the church has tried to give us explanation, thinking that if we have explanations, we'll say, okay, it makes sense. But explanation is hollow. Mm. You know, what's the explanation well, of the making left love? Side of the brain. Yeah, it's the brain. Yes. It's the meaning yeah. that tells yeah. us you belong, mm. you're here. Mm. You know? Yeah, beautiful. You said yesterday, um, at, at your evening in, in, in Westminster Cathedral, you said something. Let's see. I think I said we a lot are, of things. I know, you said a lot I of things. I talked for two hours. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful, yeah. Uh, this area is about embodiment. Yeah. Can you say more about that? Exactly. This era is about embodiment. It's, yes. so, it's so true that as, I, as we talked about earlier in this conversation, mm -hmm. uh, for about 2,500 years, part yeah. of what's called first axial consciousness mm -hmm. really depicted the world as flawed mm -hmm. and depicted the spiritual path as getting out of the body. And the yeah. body was seen to be the seat of sinful self-will, yeah. yeah. the seat of delusion, yeah. the seat of coarseness. Yeah. And everything was depicted as, you know, we're in a cave and we have to leave the cave and go to the light. So most spiritual practices were built on some variation of, of either gaining mastery over the body or even mortifying the body. Mm. But, uh, but we're in the body for a good reason. And the body is our profound vessel of truth and spiritual exploration. And so uh, coming more and more in the, in the end of the last century and into this has been a renewed appreciation of the goodness and wisdom of the body. Also in the church, within the church? It's getting into the church, but it's getting into the church by the back door, not the front door. Mm -hmm. uh, it's getting into the church because I think a lot of the people in the congregations who are now getting old are realizing that they need to do yoga to keep their bodies in shape and, uh, <laughs> and, and that if they're going to sit on a meditation cushion, they have to know how to bend their legs. Mm -hmm. So it's getting in through the, through the through the portal of wellness, yeah. I think that still in most Christian churches, if you look at how a service is actually conducted, you might as well check your body in the cloakroom when you go in because it's all just pitched at your head. Yeah. You sit in a pew and you listen and you, yes. you say words. But I think in, in other formats that are coming, our, our wisdom schools, and even in meditation when it's done properly, we, we're beginning to see more and more that we need to embody because the body actually reads uh, spiritual gesture, spiritual wisdom and coherence way better mm. 
mm. than the mind does. So the Gurdjieff dances helped you with the embodiment. Exactly. What else can we do? Well, you know, almost anything that begins to, to teach us to embody skiing. Mm. I mean, I, and one of my most powerful lessons I learned uh, about how the spiritual journey works, I learned when I was eight years old, when, when a beautiful lifeguard at a swimming pool taught me how to float. Uh -huh. You know, like, like all children, I was scared of sinking to the bottom of the pool, so I went like this. And she finally says, well, you're going to sink to the bottom right fast if you do that. Yeah. She says, fill your chest with air, put your heads back, put your hands out, and breathe, and you won't go to the bottom. This little did I know is a basic gesture of the spiritual life. It's the gesture of trust. It's the gesture of vulnerability. It's the gesture that some people will say will open mm -hmm. that, that throat chakra. Uh, you see Teresa of Avila in all the ancient artworks in exactly that position, the yeah. rapture. Yeah. So uh, from Gurdjieff I learned, even more than from the movements itself, I learned the wisdom that the body understands the language of spiritual gesture Mm. And that in the simple postures of life, in the simple taking your broom and bringing your attention to your hands on it as you sweep and being in the motion as you, as you sweep the room, not just, you know, having someone else hired to sweep your room, but participating deeply in the rhythmic nature of embodied life itself, you begin to learn something about your participation in life your belonging in life mm. that can't be had with a head which can't belong to anything because it's always separating itself from things in order to see it. Mm. So, so the world calls us to embodiment with every breath. Mm. We just have to learn to uh, attune to it again and to value the body as a sacred temple of perception not just as something that has to be kept well so we live a little longer. Mm -hmm. um, I want to touch a little bit on uh, the heart. Um, there is a lot of talk about we need to, we need to think, the brain needs to think into the heart. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, how, how do we do that? Well, the, we, are, the, we are brain people, and what does that mean? The brain needs to sink into the heart. Well, it's, it's a beautiful statement. The, the statement is actually all over Eastern Christian Orthodox yeah. practice. Uh, put the mind in the heart. Mm -hmm. Put the mind in the heart. The chief thing is that the mind should be in the heart. Mm -hmm. And they speak over and over about something called attention of the heart. Mm -hmm which is also known uh, in that tradition as vigilance and is touched in the Western Christian tradition as recollection. Uh, I, I believe, and I was saying in, in the talk we did last night uh, in London, that, uh, that one of the really powerful insights that the Christian tradition brings to the whole spiritual playing table of transformation is that these higher states of consciousness these states that we call non-dual or unitive or contemplative aren't just attained by the mind alone. That they're attained by bringing the mind into the heart, which is not just a symbol. It's not just a metaphoric way of talking about things, but is an actual physiological event so that the brain waves entrain to the, the, to the rhythm of the heart and they become a single perceptual unit. So how yes, do you Cynthia, do it? Cynthia, yes, yes. How, how do you do, you it? do it? How okay, you how do, do I do it? <laughs> uh, well, you know, just buy my book, send me $50,000 and I'll let you do it on the weekend. Uh, it's a long, slow process yeah. mm -hmm. and it has a couple of component pieces. Uh, the core attitude that the Christian tradition works with is the piece called surrender. Yeah. or kenosis. Kenosis, K-E-N-O-S-I-S, -S, yeah. is the word in Greek which St. Paul used to depict 
putting on the mind of Christ. And it, it basically is pretty close to what the Buddhists mean by non-clinging. Doesn't hang on, doesn't insist, doesn't assert, doesn't grab, mm -hmm. doesn't brace, doesn't defend, you know. It's the mind that, you know. Allowed. We try to put that mind on. Yeah, yeah. In, the, in one of the most ancient early Christian writings, the Gospel of Thomas, the students asked Jesus, what are your students like? How would you describe them? And he said, they are like small children playing in a field not their own. When the landlords come and demand, give us back our field, the children return it by stripping themselves and standing naked before them. Mm. So that's the description from Jesus of this process. So it's the lifelong practice, the core practice of learning to recognize when you've gotten into one of these postures. Tighten you know, up. Tightened, urgent, angry, self-important, mm. and in that moment... Open to hands. Open to him. Yeah. And so that's, that's the hang of it, that's the heart of it, combined with a couple of complementary practices which come more from the mindfulness sector. The one being the piece that I, I learned from the Gurdjieff work is to learn how to even notice when you're getting into these states of constriction and smaller self-urgency and yeah. automaticity yeah. because we don't notice that automatically. Mm. It's like you don't notice the moment you fall asleep at night. Mm. Uh, so you sink into these lower, unfree, mm. ugly states of being mm. automatically. Mm -hmm. So you have to learn to even notice when that happens. And the second kind there, of... There is, there is this point, I know this with yeah. myself, there is this point where you see you yeah. could go both ways. Yeah. You could serve the ego yeah. or you can surrender. Yeah. Yeah. And you can decide. Yeah. Yeah. Where There's definitely that point. Yeah. What makes it difficult though is that for a long, long time in the practice you can see that point. Mm -hmm. You can see yourself going over the waterfall mm -hmm. but you don't have the power to swim away yet. Ah, yeah. So what you have to do is live in the gap and say, Oh my God, look at what's happening to me. I, I can see that I'm sinking, but I don't have the force to stop. Yeah. And it takes a long time to, till we have the force. And to be able to see that you're, you're falling into a bad state doesn't for a long time mean that you can do anything about it. Mm -hmm. I think that's a truism that mm -hmm. disappoints many people. Mm -hmm. So the even more painful penance is you just have to sit there and watch it. Yeah. Your only real choice is can you just see it in the horror and remorse and helplessness or do you just pretend, oh well, I'm really right, I'm going to fight for this for all, you know, can you just go with a lower state or you can wait in the gap. Mm. So for me that's brought a whole new meaning to that whole British cliche, mind the gap. <laughs> <laughs> because we sit there in that gap for a long time mm. saying, oh, you know, and that's when you begin to learn the meaning of Lord have mercy. It's like, I can't do anything to raise my state, but what I can do is stay honestly ahead of, in plain sight, of what's happened, acknowledging, here I am. Yes. And I think it's from that repeated acknowledgement, that repeated acknowledgement of my own helplessness at that level, mm -hmm. but refusing to simply hide from that helplessness that gradually, 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 the energy that had originally gone into your sort of ego programs gets recaptured to begin to hold this other kind of field of awareness, of attentiveness, that's not identified with that small self acting out, and can begin to become a nest for that deeper and fuller and truer, wiser self mm. to live in. And then we begin to be. Mm. Then we begin to have being, and it's from that being that sometimes we can pull ourselves out of that spiral we were holding into, and it's from that being that we can begin to offer f our force of being to the world as love, as assistance, as a shift in the energy field for someone else, baraka, the Sufis call it. Mm. 
but it comes slowly that because you can't just kind of click your heels together and have being. It has yeah. to accumulate yeah. slowly in yeah. your being for a, a life of, of painfully bearing the crucifixion of inner honesty. Mm. And slowly right. it emerges. Yeah. So uh, one thing I like to also touch on is um, if we look at the world, it looks all very sad. Mm -hmm. And um, you wonder where it's all going. And at the same time, we say God is love. Mm -hmm. And I remember I struggled with this question already as a child. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, what do we see? What, what, what does it mean, God's love? Yeah. What does it mean how that do God we, is love? How do, how do we feel it? How do we learn to feel it and trust it, despite of what we are seeing? Yeah. Well, to begin with, the sense that it's usually presented to you as a child won't work. Because we think of God uh, as this big daddy out in the sky. Mm who has this kind of nature, you know, that, that, that he is love or he is wrath, you know, and, but that anyway that he'll fling his fire bolts or send his love. And so as long as you're holding that picture, uh, it's impossible to understand that. And I, it, it really breaks my heart to see children have to go through what you've just described yes. because you say, yes. how can God be love? If this world is suffering and cruelty and hatred and, and people are dying in Syria and Iraq and madmen are running planets and countries and what's going on? Yeah. Uh, the, the planet is, is quickly warming itself into uh, non-existence. Yes. How can God be love? Yeah. As long as you're dealing with that external God out there who's presumed to be a first cause mm. and could change things if he wanted to, <laughs> uh, then it's not going to make sense. Mm. So you have to come back to that felt sense that we were talking about earlier, that very, very deep thing that happens in your heart of hearts when you know that somehow the whole thing hangs together in a field of compassion. And that, and that the idea of a suffering God that doesn't make sense at all from a mental concept, because how can a God that's almighty suffer? Not logical, right? But when you enter that with your heart, you understand the, the catch-22 that, that divine, divine love is in, that in order to manifest this most precious dimension of love, it takes form. And when you have form, there's suffering. There's, because things are broken, they, they're yearning for wholeness, they can't have it. There's cruelty, there's automaticness. And in the midst of this, you yearn. And in the midst of it, you find that something holds together. And that, and that the fact that God is love, it's true, it doesn't depend on the world being bright and twinkly and sparkly outside. As a matter of fact, it's exercised and touched most deeply in those moments of poignant heartbreak. That somehow, yes, even this holds together and is the chalice of love poured out, of God's yearning to touch the world mm -hmm. and to hold it. Mm -hmm. it's, like a, it's like the sun yearning to hold a snowflake. <laughs> you can't do it without no. melting it. Yeah. And that's the suffering of God to let it be, to let it, to let it have to shoulder its planks constant of horror and, 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 and pain, and, and to still love it, and to still be accessible in love. Mm -hmm. So we grow, I think, as human beings uh, in our own capaciousness, it's a word I've used before, to hold this every which wayness of love this love that that's, won't be killed in the midst of suffering and yet won't make suffering go away. This love where you see hearts broken, lives touched apart, and yet love holds. And when, when your own heart becomes deep enough to hold a piece of this, then you become part of the mystical heart of universal love. 
Mm. And it, it doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel feel blissful. You know, I think one of the one of the cliches that's thrown on the spiritual journey is that it's about making you feel blissful states all the time. Yeah. No. When you open your heart to the world, what you what you can guarantee is that your heart is going to be broken. And to, to hear the pain of the world and to hold the pain of the world. So it's something way beyond bliss. It's that every which wayness of the the reality mm-hmm. of love in the midst of brokenness. Mm-hmm. Uh, and as we begin to hold that, we, we sense the coherence and the cost by which everything holds together. Mm-hmm. But you never touch it with your head. Mm-hmm. You know, religion is not a philosophy. God is not a first cause. All that level is just explanation. Mm-hmm. Meaning is something different. Yeah. So that brings up the question in me, what is then freedom? What is freedom? Yeah, because Um, we go on this journey, mm -hmm. we start out on this journey to become free. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. Which we call enlightenment. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, we have so many mixed metaphors as, 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 as Western and Eastern ways of contexting reality come together like tectonic plates yes. and they don't often match up. I think in a very obvious way freedom freedom is easy but you know and at the obvious level what it means is what you'd call freedom from the false self mm-hmm. you know that uh, that that most of us think we're free and yet we're not free at all because we're under the absolute compulsion of agendas, addictions, and aversions that have been programmed into us from early life and sometimes from the womb. You know, we have our values, we have our our triggers, we have our flashpoints, uh, we have our agendas. And and as uh, A.H. Almas said so famously, uh, freedom to be your ego is not freedom. Mm because that's slavery. You're being pulled around by a bullring, you know, in the nose. So part of the work of freedom begins when you can stabilize in yourself this thing uh, that that some of the Eastern traditions helpfully call witnessing presence, which is something deeper that's not dependent on the pain-pleasure principle, Mm -hmm. that's not attracted by attraction or repulsed by aversion, you know, that as my teacher Rafe, the hermit monk of Snowmass, Colorado, used to say, mm-hmm. I want to have enough being to be nothing, mm-hmm. which means he's not dependent on the world to give him his identity mm-hmm. because his learned his identity nests in something much deeper. Yeah. So that's the first level of freedom. But I think beyond that, what makes it difficult is, is the is that old cliche that comes out of the Anglican tradition talking about uh, our relationship to Christ in whose freedom, whose freedom is perfect service. And it's the freedom you know when you fall helplessly in love with somebody that they're, you know, you're not free to walk away because you see the coherence of your life. You see the only pattern in which your life could fit. Like for me back then, when I wasn't free to choose to be a Sufi or a Buddhist, because the path of coherence is this way. Yeah. And as you, as you finally become free to follow the, what you might call the homing beacon of your own inner calling, you realize that, that it's only in that complete obedience that freedom lies. And of course, the trick to that is the word obedience which we really usually think means knuckling under a capi- or capitulating, mm-hmm. really comes from the Latin ob audire, which means to listen deeply. Mm-hmm. So as we listen deeply to the fundamental kind of what you might call the tuning fork of our being, which is given us to us not by ourself, and is never about self-realization, because the self melts as that realization yeah. comes closer. Yeah. You know, you find the only freedom is to be your own cell in the vast mystical body of God. Mm. Beautifully. 
But you have to get free of the false self to see that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you spend a lot of time in solitude. I mean, three months a year, I think. Well, that would that's the that's the it's game the plan. Game. <laughs> As I say in Hamlet, more honored in the breach than the observance. But yes, yes I have spent some time in solitude. Yes, and and silence. Mm -hmm. And um, how how does that work for you? What what do what does that give you? Uh, honesty. Mm. You know that 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 we often equate it with, uh, you know, we go into silence to find profound states of being, and this, mm -hmm. uh, this will come around, but, but the first thing that silence does is it, it ruthlessly exposes the evasions. And the first evasion is simply uh, our own or my own restlessness. You begin to discover how jumpy you are. And then you begin to discover the evasion of time mm. and how we set our life up with a schedule. We get up and we wake up at a certain time and we, we do our prayer practices and we, we have our meals then and we have a... In other words, we've, we've parceled our whole day out on this kind of linear continuum and all of a sudden, you know, it begins to hit you like a freight train. There's simply this now and we're breaking it up into bits so that we can <laughs> not be squashed by it. So you begin to see these evasions, you begin to see these screens that you put up to live in the world. Um, you begin to see that so much of what you thought you were about is only being cued to that evasion you've already set in place. So the first is just falling through your own restlessness and beginning to de develop a little bit of capacity to live in your own skin. And I, I think for me that this is really what incarnation, you know, what, what solitude is about. It's about becoming more restful in embodiment, about being able to confront and fall through that ever kind of restless tendency that, that so many of us are fundamentally autophobic we don't live comfortably in our own skin. We're always projecting it out there. Okay. My, my path, my enlightenment, my practices, my, you know, where I'll be next year. Stop, be. But it's, you know, it's squizzly for a while. Mm. And then you finally drop through that. My, my hermit teacher used to say, you have to endure the tedium until something emerges in it. And then what develops is an expanded pra capacity for restful presence in a larger field of the now. Mm -hmm. The nows get longer and longer and are not broken up into time things so much. So you don't do anything particularly different. You just do it with, with, a, with a deeper and deeper rhythm of being grounded in something beyond our kind of completely human artificial constructions of what reality actually is structured like. Mm. Beautiful. You know. Well, our time is slowly running out. <laughs> oh, well, speaking of time. <laughs> speaking of time. So if we were good hermits, we, we cannot, just sort of relax and be here for another four months. <laughs> we just cannot just be in the now and uh -huh. <laughs> let it all unfold. Um, is there anything else, like one or two sentences, you still would like to say to our audience? Um, well, I, I think that the one thing that I would say is that, that, that Hermit work is not done alone. It looks like the ultimate kind of, well, she goes off by herself and nobody sees her. Yeah. But you really are in solidarity with the hearts of everybody. And, and, and my belief is that so many of the models we've used in our spirituality of the past are individualistic models, even right up to enlightenment, my personal self-realization. But what happens is when we enter that deep, deep heart space, it's transpersonal. It's personal and it transpersonal. It, it, it touches the heart space of everybody else, both living and beyond living. Mm -hmm. And so it's ultimately a communal form. And, and I do believe that particularly in this next era of our spiritual unfolding, along with embodiment, 
we're going to understand again much more keenly an era of human solidarity and a higher collectivity. And my own work when I go and teach is always in the service of that union. Mm -hmm. Way, way back when I, when I had that communion at 20, uh, it's the, the words are, this is my body given for you. And the, the sense that our whole common sentient being is the body yeah. of Christ, or the body of God, or the body of Buddha. Pick your, yeah. pick your bodhisattva. But we're forming something that's, that's higher and deeper, which can more worthily and deeply bear those beams of love. Thank you. It's a beautiful ending, Cynthia. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, you are happy to do, uh, I finished this program now, and you're, you're happy to do afterwards a 10 minutes meditation with us or oh, centering certainly. prayer? Certainly, okay. I'm in your hands. Okay, so um, that was Cynthia Boy's show. And uh, stay tuned for the meditation afterwards. And I say thank you for watching Conscious TV. And I see you again a little bit later. Bye-bye. Hello, I'm Cynthia Bourgeau. We're on Conscious TV. And after a wonderful interview with Renata, I'd like to now join, ask you to join me in a short time of meditation. My core practice that I've used for, for 30 years now has been Centering Prayer, a wonderful and simple form of meditation in the Christian tradition uh, that was developed by my own teacher, Father Thomas Keating, to help bring an authentic path of meditation back into active Christian practice. So Centering Prayer is a, is a non-clinging meditation practice. It really works with the simple idea of release, release, release. Moving our mind from a state of being attached to an object to a state of letting go letting go. And this is an imitation of, of Christ's great motion of letting go, letting go, letting go, described by St. Paul as self-emptying. So here's how it works. In centering prayer, your intention is to let go of every very thought, any idea. A thought is anything that brings your attention to a focal point, whether it's an idea or an emotion or an itch on your nose. If you become aware your attention is attached to it, you simply let it go. And to let it go, to help with that, you choose a simple, short word or short phrase, one or two syllables, a word like God or peace or let go, to help remind you, sweep it away, let it go. So. Whenever you begin to be aware that you're engaged with thinking, just let it go. And the idea here is not to try to make your mind empty or still, but simply to practice this gesture. As, as someone once uh, asked Thomas Keating after meditation, I'm such a failure at meditation. I, in 10 minutes, I've had 10,000 thoughts. How lovely, said Thomas. 10,000 opportunities to return to God. So every time you let go of a thought, even if another comes back, you're practicing this deep motion of non-clinging, letting go, consenting, surrendering in meditation form. So we're going to meditate for about, oh, a little over five minutes together. I'll lead you into it with a chant and lead you out of it with that same chat. So, Spirit of Truth, enter my mind. Soul of Wisdom, enter my heart. Spirit of Truth, enter 
enter my mind, soul of wisdom, enter my heart. Spirit of truth, enter my mind, soul of wisdom, enter my heart. Spirit of truth, enter my mind, soul of wisdom, 